Good evening, Harmony Grove family. I'm Cliff, I'm support staff here at Harmony Grove Baptist Church, and uh, we, we have another home talk tonight. I'm glad you're joining us. Uh, last time I spoke, uh, the title was The Mind of Christ. Well, tonight uh, the topic is Love Your Neighbor, but really it's a sequel to The Mind of Christ. It's um, a continuation of that thought. How do we live our life as Christians, as followers of Jesus, and have that same mindset that Christ had? We're going to be thinking about uh, the times that we live in right now and the way we've had to rethink uh, basic greetings, handshakes, those kinds of things. And tonight we'll be thinking about rethinking church, faith, and our witness and our attitudes towards those. Something happened to me this week. I was talking to an older gentleman and I had shared my faith with him and um, he was appreciative and he was thanking me. And he reached out his hand to, to shake my hand and say thank you. And in that instant, I had this thought, what do I do? Do I shake his hand? Do I say no? Do I back away? I shook his hand. but. I use my hand sanitizer also. But uh, we're having to rethink how we, we do the most basic things that we've done for so long that we don't even think about except extending our hand to someone in, in a greeting. When Maine and I were young, we, uh, we were sent to a training that was called CWT, Continuous Witness Training. And this training uh, was to teach us to be better witnesses for Christ and the premise was that we went around door to door and we knocked on doors, cold call. Um, we had to memorize about a dozen scriptures and we would go into someone's living room. Back then you could get into somebody's living room much easier than today. And you would start off with the question of when you die, are you going to go to heaven? And then you would convince them over a series of verses, one after the other, and beat them down until finally you got them to pray a prayer and to accept Jesus as their Savior. Now, I say that a little bit uh, mockingly, but that's not how we see Jesus doing ministry. That's not how we see Jesus approaching people with the gospel. And so even things that we've learned over our lifetime, we may need to rethink about the way we do church and the way we live out our faith. I'd like for us to, to look at the scripture in Mark chapter 12, 28, uh, 28 to 31. Mark 12, 28 to 31. And this is a time when Jesus was talking to the scribes and Pharisees and they were challenging him and they were testing him actually with this question. One of the scribes came and heard them arguing and recognized that he had answered them well and asked him, what commandment is foremost of all? Jesus answered, the foremost is, Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God is one Lord, and you shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your mind, and with all your strength. The second is this, you shall love your neighbor as yourself. There is no other commandment greater than this. All your heart, your soul, your mind, your strength. This ties into the mind of Christ that we talked about last time. So being a follower of Christ, a disciple, means so giving over my life to him that it's not dependent on whether I'm able to go sit in a pew on Sunday morning and listen to the pastor preach. It's more about a transformation of my being towards a focus on Jesus. And the second part of that is love your neighbor as yourself. Well, how can we do that? Recently, I was in another town working and I had the opportunity to uh, meet a family and I had a long talk with, with the man of the house. And I shared with him my faith in Jesus Christ. And I asked him, was he connected to a, to a church body? And we began to talk and he shared some of his story. And in that story, 
he talked about he believed in a higher power. Well, I had the sense that he, he wasn't walking with the Lord on a daily basis. And so I asked another uh, man that I knew in that town uh, if his church could reach out to this family and get to know them. And the man said to me, um, He's welcome to come to our service anytime. We have service at 11 o'clock on Sunday. Well, when the pandemic is over. And I said to him, I don't think this family will come to church on their own. Is there someone that could go and meet with him and get to know him? And he said, let me give you my pastor's uh, name and phone number. And he gave me the pastor's name and phone number. I still, wa I still wasn't satisfied. And I spoke to someone else that I knew. And the next day, uh, this other fellow came back to me and said, oh, I went and asked the man if he was born again. He told me he was. So that was the end of the story. You know, we may be stuck in certain ways about church attendance. And I'm not saying we shouldn't invite people to church. Certainly we should invite people to church. But right now, they can't come to church. Certainly we should tell our pastor what we're doing and the ministries we're involved in. But that's not what God's called us to do as disciples. He's called us to be the disciples. And certainly there's some questions that are appropriate to ask people, but there's not a magic question or a magic prayer that we can get someone to pray and receive Christ and assure them that they're good without having them enter into a relationship with Jesus Christ as Lord and Savior. So when we, we hear in the Bible, it says, it has been said, but I say, Jesus says, it has been said, invite them to church, but Jesus sent out his disciples. It has been said, tell the pastor, it's his job to do. But Jesus said, you can't be my disciple if you're not willing to take up, take up your cross and follow me. And it's been said, if you just get them to pray a prayer. But Jesus said that we're to enter into a relationship with him as sons and daughters of the king. But relationships take time. And forming relationships with people that we're working with also take time. You remember some time ago, Scotty uh, talked one Sunday about who's your one. A who's your one? And he gave us a bookmark. If you still have that, pull it out. Take a look at it. Who did you write down as the person that you committed to reach out to during this year? And are you doing that? And if you haven't filled it out, consider choosing someone that God's laying on your heart to minister to. Jesus was re reasoning with Pharisees and religious leaders. And we see some stories in the Bible of Jesus arguing with the Pharisees and convincing them or backing them into a corner to show them the truth. But we don't see Jesus responding that way to people that he meets on a daily basis. We see Jesus dealing in relationships with people. So I wanna take a lightning tour of the New Testament, of some stories of Jesus, five stories of Jesus, and how he treated people when he encountered them. The first is the Good Samaritan. Now, that's not Jesus. That's a parable that Jesus told. But Jesus told it in order to teach us. But in the Good Samaritan story, and you'll know that story, a man was beaten by robbers. And three people came by. Two of them were religious leaders. They were afraid. They were afraid of what might happen to them. They were afraid to get involved. And they passed him by. But a Samaritan of a different race normally would be looked down on by the man who was injured. But he stopped and he helped. So people in need, we see Jesus teaching us about helping people who have needs. And in Luke 10, 30 to 37, you can read that story. The Samaritan went out of his way and made a relationship with that person, took them, took care of them, and was involved in their lives. And Jesus said, go and do likewise. The second story is a woman at the well. You'll remember that story too. It's a very, very familiar story. But this was a lady who was drawing water in the middle of the day because 
probably because she was a sinful woman and might not have felt comfortable with the other ladies in the evening drawing water or in the early morning. But she was there in the middle of the day and Jesus had arranged his time so that he would be there at the same time that she was. And Jesus broke social norms of the day and spoke to a woman and a Samaritan woman at that. Now, Jesus didn't let the sin go. He didn't ignore the fact that she was sinful. He brought that out and he corrected her, but he did so in a loving and a progressive approach of establishing a relationship with her. He didn't say, you're dying and go to hell if you don't accept Jesus as your savior. He didn't start off that way. So God calls us to minister to people in need and people who are living in sin, who are struggling with sin in their lives. You can read this story in John 4, 7 to 26. Don't need to write all that down. It's all going to be on a slide at the end. And I challenge you to read these stories with your family and talk about who you know as a family or as an individual that you can be reaching out to and ministering to. The next story is the story of Matthew, Matthew the disciple. Jesus called him. He was a tax collector. He was a sinner. Uh, we're all sinners, but Matthew, Matthew particularly was taking advantage of people with his tax collecting. And he had lots of friends. So when Jesus said to Matthew, follow me, Matthew got up and he followed Jesus. But what came natural to Matthew is he threw a party at his house. And his friends came over. And his friends were also tax collectors and sinners. And Jesus went to the party. And they were probably had, were serving drinks and, and having a good old time. And Jesus was there ministering to Matthew and his friends. And the religious leaders complained about Jesus and criticized him. What, you eat with sinners? But Jesus ministered to this new Christian, Matthew, and his friends. Because that's who God had placed in Jesus' path that day. And that story is in Matthew 9, 9 to 12. Jesus said, I did not come to call the righteous, but the sinners. And so we can't have that attitude of separating ourselves from people that aren't like us or who haven't fully understood the gospel or the depth of the relationship with Christ. We've got to invest that time to be with them in order to have the to gain the right and the privilege to share with them. The fourth story is the story of Zacchaeus. Zacchaeus, the little man that climbed in the tree and the little kid's song about that, well, I'm not going to sing it for you today. But people on the fringe, people are, who are holding back, who maybe been burned by church or, or, or don't want to get involved or don't want to get too close because somebody might see him going to that church or might see him involved with a Christian. Zacchaeus had a lot of reasons to climb up that tree, not just his stature, but he, he probably didn't want to be seen too close to Jesus, didn't want to commit. Jesus leaves the direction he was walking, and he walks up to the tree, and he looks up to Zacchaeus, and he said, Come down. I must go to your house today. I must go to your house today. Jesus took the initiative to go to him, not wait till he came to Jesus. And sometimes we have the attitude of, well, if they really want to know, they can come to church and, and hear the message. But as disciples, Jesus has set a path for us, a direction, guidance about serving. That story is found in Luke 19, 1 through 10. And Jesus wraps it up by saying, I've come to seek and to save that which is lost. And in the last story is a continuation of the story of Peter that I told last time I spoke. Peter being restored. After Peter had denied Jesus three times and the cock crowed and he went out and he wept bitterly. This portion of scripture that we're going to read from John 21, 15 to 19 is what happened next. The scripture in John 21, verse, starting at verse 15, it says, So when they had finished breakfast, Jesus said to Simon Peter, Simon, son of John, do you love me more than these? He said to him, Yes, Lord, you know that I love you. He said to him, Tend my lambs. 
He said to him again a second time, Simon, son of John, do you love me? He said to him, yes, Lord, you know that I love you. He said to him, shepherd my sheep. He said to him a third time, Simon, son of John, do you love me? And Peter was grieved because he said to him the third time, do you love me? And he said to him, Lord, you know all things. You know that I love you. And Jesus said to him, tend my sheep. This is the New American Standard Translation, but other translations, it says, feed my sheep. But what we see here is that Jesus believes in a man with a past. And when we're called to love our neighbor, that includes people who have messed up in the past, who have repented and come back and are accepted. And that's one of the things I love about the Harmony Grove family, is that in general, we are, we're caring for people, even people who've been burned by church. And if you are hearing this and, and you've been reluctant to come back to church or come back to the faith that you once experienced, I would encourage you to find a family, a faith family that is like Jesus in this respect. That yes, feed my sheep, get to work. But Jesus forgives every sin, every sin of your past, that you can come to serve him and to love him and to, to minister for him, regardless of what's happened in your past. So how do we have the mind of Christ to be the church where we are? If we can't meet in the church building, how can we be his church in our homes, on the phone, in our social media? in order to fulfill his command to love others. Who's God put in your path for you to minister to? How can you love them like Jesus loved people? Who's your one? Who's your one that you're gonna be ministering to during these times of isolation? As Jesus was hanging on the cross, giving his life for us, only later to be resurrected from the tomb, but as he was hanging on the cross, what were his words? Father, forgive them, for they don't know what they do. That's an image of ultimate love for our neighbor. Jesus never intended to create a religion of rituals and right words and quick prayers. But Jesus came to create a culture of grace and compassion and relationship and engagement. And so I invite you to rethink maybe some things you've learned in your past, but to rethink your responsibility as a disciple of Christ or to come into relationship with Jesus Christ, even if now for the first time, to serve him as a disciple in a way that affects other people's lives, that touches people, that draws them to Jesus. Let that be our goal this week, to find who God has called us to minister to. Let's pray. Thank you, Lord, for your redemption that's made possible only through Jesus Christ on the cross and his resurrection, and that you loved us and, and befriended us in such a way as to forgive all the past things that we've done and, and rebelled against you and we thank you for that. Lord, just help us to be aware of our responsibility to take up our cross and to follow you and to serve others the way that you have called us to serve. It's in Jesus' name I pray. Amen. Thank you and good night.